Hello everyone, today we talk about Roman early imperial shield designs or digmata. Um, more than one year ago I think we made a video on the shield designs of the Notitia Dignitatum uh, that you know is this text that survived through medieval manuscripts about essentially yeah, the, the shield insignia or blazons, whatever you want to call them of the, at that point, actually the late Roman army, in basically the 4th and partly, I think, even the, the, the beginning of the 5th century, uh, which is an extraordinary source, as you see, that we didn't really comment, we made a list, essentially, it was, uh, I didn't talk in the video, it was just um, a Roman soundtrack in the background, uh, and then all the shields um, with the name of the unit under it, you can look at it, it's in the Roman warfare playlist, and uh, today I wanted to do basically the same thing with the uh, shield designs of the earlier uh, imperial time. But it's a bit of a different kettle of fish because sources are different. We have nothing like the uh, Notitia de Nihatum surviving from, from the 5th century um, and uh, for, for the early Roman Empire um, uh, in the same way. Uh, we actually have, however, a lot of iconography about these designs figuring uh, primarily, in fact, on the Roman shields. So uh, there have been re um, some researchers, some books that have tried to basically systematize these um, these designs, uh, basically referencing them to the single unit of belonging, right? Which probably, as we will see today, was was really the case, right? The problem is that we don't have any ba categorization and homogeneity in a set of these sources, so it can really be a lot of different things at the same time. Even in part, the same changing of, of the unit design on the base of, you know, maybe th they, they had it different in some ways, legionary troops had it in one way, auxiliary troops in another, seemingly, Right, so we, we really don't know, as actually most things ancient Roman, right? We think we know about the Roman army of the time, we, we know almost nothing, right? We are dramatically lucky that, of course, the civilization produced this enormous amount of sources for those time standards, but for, you know, our knowledge is still a very few to let us understand what this thing really was. Mm -hmm. So we have to go a bit, uh, I thought today of, you know, deepening a bit into the, the problem of the interpretation rather than presenting all the various digmat, right? Um, so, um, we have also made another video, by the way, about um, a Roman shield painting uh, in the, actually in the early empire, if you go back, it's a kind of a bit of an old video, but it kind of tells a bit the the main theories that exist, especially concerning in that specific video, the uh, I mean the, the concept of uniformation, right, of standardization and things like this that naturally have to be circumstance shaded. Uh, th there was definitely a degree of uniformity, but talking about standardization is quite not the case. Um, so this thing should be analyzed a bit more also under the light of tactical employment. Today we will look chiefly at what we know proper about the, possi the, the connection of a specific design, a given design, no, we will not list them as such, that's why we'll make him another video with all the shield designs, um, like the other one, and uh, 2D unit of reference, like did we try to answer the question, like were actually units using um, certain symbols of uh, recognition over their shield, right, rather than just through their standards and other and other devices, which actually they had. Today we we'll we look even at helmets, uh, etc. Well, the answer is generally yes, but let's see what we know this from. So there is an episode for the civil wars uh, in Italy. The, the in AD 69, the year of four emperors, and mentioned by Tacitus. Um, which tells us that the auxilia, right, uh, the legionaries and the praetorians, respectively, were distinguished by their own insignia. And Tacitus, in this occasion, uh, specifies that, uh, literally in Latin, Galeis scuti, which therefore means that these insignia that it was referring to were. Uh, 
represented in the elements and the shields, right? Which is kind of an already an interesting hint, considering that definitely troops normally used, as you know, certain, f for example, feathers, ponytails, crests for specific um, troopers. Um, and this was something very common in the ancient world that didn't really disappear from the most iconic um, representation, certification, if you want, of the Roman legionnaire, like uh, Republican times, yes, the, the Roman legionnaire was closer to the Italic warrior, conceptually speaking, it had this feathers, maybe was, there was definitely a less degree of, 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 of uniformity in their regard, but still you know, the, the functions remain the same, so actually not just NCOs or th this kind of things in their helmets, also legionaries did as far as we can um, theorize. Um, but um, the, uh, and naturally also picturing, not naturally we don't know, I think that even helmets could ha be of could be decorated in some form, it could be naturally identifiable, though maybe the average trooper really wore pr pretty standard, simple helmets at the same time. It, we, the problem is that we don't really know uh, a lot about this. We know even in, in terms of production, manufacturing that, yes, there was a, a great degree of, of variety of forms, of styles, etc. There were even, um, they definitely belonged to the unit in some way, and that even had some kind of local tendencies. Uh, legionnaires had their gear actually d given by the state in certain cases, but a, a part of it would actually be both locally and even made on their own locally. So that's why we can't even trace this difference says partially. But here we're talking really about the unit of belonging, and it's obvious that the shield as such was actually a way better way, uh, yeah, a way better way, better mean um, to display this insignia, right? That, that because of of the largeness of the surface, because the the, the same material also was better to uh, to to mm, decorate in that fashion, and Tacitus therefore explains that these attributes as helmet crests and shield blades and s as you know being well widespread at the time. Something once again very old. Shields uh, were quite colorful since ever, basically, and naturally th there were particular tactical needs for wanting, uh, especially the most independently dynamic units, to be easily recognizable on the field. Right, and in fact, the same Vegetius actually later on, fourth century, says this explicitly that. Mm, so Vegetius, you know, he's talking about um, in part the the army of his time, in part the to you know these older times that he was kind of fantasizing about. In part, um, especially on the on the base of standards of efficiency and so on, and he says as that basically certain units had their shield painted all in one fashion, so that the the soldiers wouldn't get lost. Uh, implicitly in the battle in here. I mean, those who went away from the unit could easily recognize it from the colors. This was very important. There were other ways to distinguish yourself, not just through insignia, but even vocally, right? There were certain passwords that you had to exchange uh, for, you know, being recognized. This is something used basically in every army at the time, even and later on. The means are all fundamentally the same. Um, the passage from Tacitus should be connected with an episode of the Gallic Wars where Caesar recounts that the Romans were so surprised by a Belgian attack that they were unable to arrange the insignia on their helmets and to remove the shield covers, the tegumenta or tegimenta, um, as prescribed in the, in the battle order. Um, this is very important because, once again, it stresses basically that the helmet, not just the um, the shield had this function of insignia, right? It could be showed, and this is particularly interesting also because here the Romans were fighting, like uh, Tacitus' example, against barbarians, not against other Romans that were equipped in kind of similar fashion, right? Um, this is important maybe for reasons that go even beyond the 
I mean, naturally, the various Roman units had to recognize themselves on, on the field um, from one another, right? But probably there was also a matter of of pride and of esprit de corps and of identity for which, you know, if I fight against someone, I don't want to hide who I am. I want to be recognized. I want to display my full um, character in this battle. And don't think that these psychological aspects are secondary. Actually, I think they're very mm, underrated as uh, there is really a commitment here that is g goes way beyond the technicality of warfare itself, in spite of the importance of this visual and also the the audio, you know, um, signals that were definitely quite important. Um, and the interesting thing about the about what Caesar wrote is also that, in fact, the shield covers had to be removed. Um, it's interesting. We saw the the same shield covers actually had certain tablets from which was written to uh, to whom that shield specifically belonged and the unit of reference so that's quite meaningful once again uh, that's also qu something quite intuitive but it's still um, needed and associated with the, the same you know picture on, on, on the shield in some way um, uh, in, inside the tegumenta that that is probably the, the single most important part of the story, but naturally here there is also a matter of protection of keeping these um, the same paint probably even on, on the shields kind of preserved, right, because things get worn out pretty easily, especially in war. So that's something even that you have to account in the costs of the whole thing. One, one element that plays, let's say, in this favor, we could say, of um, the Uniform uniformity of uh, legionary colors in general, especially the legionary level, right, a single legion, is that objectively the Romans spent already an enormous amount of money to uh, equip these troops first of all, that then supply them, etc. And you know, adding to this cost even the one of you know of paint uh, of let's say of uh, these colors that sometimes were even fairly you know not cheap, right, to to employ. It was an extra cost, and especially an, a, you know another logistical, you know another production system that the army had basically rely on. That probably, in fact, was mm, was instead left to the same legionnaires, and in part in this regard to the same local practices. Like there is no really need to tell a unit to start uh, using certain uh, emblems um, to for for tactical purposes but also for esprit de corps they're going to do it anyway right uh, this is what also other peoples actually did think even about sort of belonging to to well okay I mean, tribalism to, to to the group in general to certain religious symbolism but it was all very blurry the right? regular the same roman legionnaires after all they weren't that far from from uh, culturally speaking, for in for those time, let's say for our time standards, after all, from from the enemies they were fighting against, many times, especially the auxiliaries, but also part the same legionaries in the previous generations were the same people that the same Romans were fighting. <laughs> so this is all the more interesting. In fact, uh, what Tacitus said before is um fascinating because it says that the auxilia the legionaries and the praetorians were distinguished each owned by their own insignia and we know especially for the auxilia that by at this point the units were um you know standard i mean th they were framed in a you know they were permanent basically in the in the roman army um and therefore had acquired a certain specific unit identity well you know it, it still Many, especially in that year, the year four emperors, we still have evidence from the same sources that these guys sometimes fought with their native equipment. Sometimes even still with fours. With you know, it's a bit stereotypical. Maybe the Romans were trying to stretch that, but it's still mm, r quite realistic, actually. Um, so it would be interesting to know many other things, even the hierarchy of this insignia, because naturally. Um, there was all a religious meaning attached to it, and the coexistence, the cooperation of these units had also to do with probably cultural factors. Um, uh, this is the same time of the 
a revolt of the Batanians, right? The, as Roman auxiliaries eventually you know, were in part Roman auxiliaries, uh, they, they they took over certain um, you know certain you know, Roman uh, factories, etc. They did their equipment, so it's mm, and they knew the, the Roman military in the first place, so. Um, you can imagine the heterogeneity all in this whole picture, right? Um, so this insignia, as uh, in Latin, the word called was all the the um, were represented by certain designs that the Romans called with the Latinized term of digmata um, from the Hellenic digmata, right? And that's the actually the term that Vegetius uses in the example we made before. Um, and they were essentially unit badges, right? I mean, the, the, the here it's important to stress we're talking about this, the individual soldiers. So this is still not a matter of um, unit insignia, uh, like the the actual symbols, the the standards, etc. We're talking about the single soldier. Also, Tacitus again mentions two Praetorians who, after taking two enemy shields from the ground managed to infiltrate their actually Roman opponents and performed an act of valor. Now this is also a very famous um, uh, passage because it basically shows that at that point, um, at least in theory, obviously this is narrative sources, we take them as in general as, you know, as for what they are, but effectively it seems that the only way sometimes to distinguish troops from one another on the field, especially during Roman civil wars, like in this case, was the shield, right? Because for the rest, they were equipped basically in the same way. And there are many reasons for this. Also, think about clothing. I mean, clothing is the thing that gets worn out more easily in general. And think about dust, blood, um, the the literal decomposition of the of the textile. So we know, as a matter of fact, that in ancient Rome, the the difference between the military man and the civilian was given by the, the sheer fact that the military man bore arms, right? Think about the Kingulum Militaris, I mean, for where they, they hanged the, the sword in the first place, that also in medieval times would become the, the equivalent of the same knighthood, right? And, and in this sense of manhood and kind of military uh, identity, well, uh, that was the distinguishing factor. There was no need in that regard to, to use other and signs because hey that's a military man but that was in a civilian environment during a civil war between Romans naturally the shield at that point was could be easily the better discriminant in this regard um, so much that these two Praetorians managed to infiltrate uh, other Roman troops and to you know start uh, fighting against them from the within mm -hmm. Um, so all these elements, together with the unit standards or signa, that were literally the the, the standards of of of, of the legion, uh, can help could help us at least to recognize the various corpses depicted on the Roman monuments. I mean, this is literally it, right? Considering these passages, we've said we have plenty of iconography about Roman shields with designs on them. So we we make this um, logical leap by taking for granted in some ways that these designs were actually some form in, in, by, by standardized by, by a certain degree and that we're referring to the unit of reference right and this is a bit dangerous uh, to, to do for, for many reasons first of all the iconographic sources are iconographic sources once again we know how much they differ for example from archaeology um, not that they radically differ, but it, like in this case, we actually even have e examples of 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 the of these designs being present on the shield. The problem is that we don't have any direct confirmation of the um, evidence that uh, more than else, not much that they, they these designs weren't representative of, of the unit, but of, of which unit, and did they vary in some way? Well, we, we don't really know. Um, so, as we have seen, a certain type of dress or kind of armor would not have been a very useful means of identification for the unit. right? We know more or less what the Romans used as weapons, and they were pretty much 
uh, all blended together, right? We we there is a lot of, well, it is a bit difficult to to talk about this. There is a, there are huge debates of whether the Romans actually equipped directly and um, uh, the troops, in fact, at which point I don't know the the legions stationed in a in a certain province differed maybe from um, the ones of others. You know, the, but we we are not concerned by this. But the point is that even if they had differed, uh, they wouldn't differ probably so much, if not in details, actually, that weren't purposely um, identification-oriented, let's put it in this sense, um, than, than the actual substance of the equipment that more or less was the same. We should get used, though, to the idea that is actually confirmed by all the sources we have at our disposal that actually the, the 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 Roman equipment varied wildly uh, at this point like you you d we would be surprised to see how much certain even legionnaires just to stop it there to not, not even talking about auxiliaries actually um, varied their their equipment on a regular base right the the concept the essence of it remaining the same because hey even out you know in other peoples that was like it right and as moderns we have this tendency to standardize on a certain stereotype essentially a certain model a certain category by saying ah this thing this weapon this model you belong to, to we see it for for these people hence you know that whatever we find that it's it's that people no we've done a lot of mistakes uh, regarding this without considering that um, even outside the Roman world, actually, the, 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 there was a lot of blending of laws. You know, take the similarities that you can find in the armor of, I don't know, the Eurasian steppes in many areas of the Middle East, for example. What do you know whether it's something, it's Sarmatian or Sassanid, right? You, you can't really tell. Um, and, and, and that's why certain interpretations that sometimes we take as, in fact, as simple like we I explained this thing chiefly in the video on the Roman Levantine archers uh, I don't remember I whether I called it in that way but that was effectively the point that we think that uh, the Syrian archers uh, Syrian auxiliaries of uh, archi auxiliary archers of the Roman army were uh, were in s equipped in a certain fashion in fact because they were Syrian but if you look more closely at their equipment well, that equipment was shared by lots of other peoples all around, you know, the the Middle East, the Pontic area, the steppes, right, and and even the Balkans at some point. So, um, and it doesn't even make sense. Like, if if even if those weapons and armors had been produced there, they, they could easily be employed by elsewhere in the world, right? The stuff traveled was exported was, you know, uh, there was a market. This thing that yeah, okay, of course the the, the Roman state kept under control they they, they they controlled it they they tended to disarm the local populations in general but it never completely and and they could rely on this multitude and varieties of, of equipment um, and um, the we have also to consider that um, the in fact not even the same units uh, necessarily were equipped with the same weapons like even the legionary heavy infantry that we know essentially had that specific tactical purpose and therefore had to be equipped in a certain way will probably have different levels of, of armoredness this was actually normal in many arm uh, many armies all over and we don't have the certainty that actually every uh, legionnaire was equipped in the same way within the unit there was all like a lesser administration that especially when the, st the state armories began I mean I mean the, the privately conventioned with the state armories let's say better began to you know become central in the uh, production and delivery of uh, weapons and armor still th there is this lesser level that goes from you know uh, you know the, the NCOs down uh, that was the most actively involved probably in this kind of uh, business uh, affairs uh, regulations maybe just with the first officers uh, the lowest officers um, managed the, the thing in ways we don't know because nobody actually wrote about it 
right? We we know very few about the the actual technicalities of how troops were equipped, and we know from literary passages that definitely so heavy. Uh, I mean, legionnaires that were stand, you know, stereotypically heavily, heavily, uh, you know, heavy infantry sometimes fought even as light infantry quite easily. They could use even you know missile weapons. They they actually spent even a lot of time just being trained that way. They could go on a horseback, right, on a regular base assigned from the Turmai that accompanied every legion. So um, we have to stay flexible at the idea that nothing is really peculiar to a, s a specific kind of view. And it's like those people who say, well, you can't say that even the the auxiliaries used the segmented armor because you know we don't know it was so rich and expand. I mean, so well, uh, so expansive and costly, and um, we don't even know to whom it was distributed. Yeah, but we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years in 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 a system that had permanently on um, on the field of hundreds of thousands of troops. And do you want to come to me telling me even in the face of evidence of actually uh, auxiliary force that had those kind of weapons found in them? Uh, armor finding can and, and lots of other evidence that also suggests over that point that no auxiliary ever wore any kind of this armor. Of course they did, and also considering that auxiliaries in the early imperial times actually fought much more on average than uh, the uh, the the legionnaires themselves that were camped usually in reserve for being employed in a specific tactical role. But why wouldn't you, uh, given especially that legionnaires were fighting? Um, on, on on a regular base, shoulder to shoulder with with auxiliaries. I mean, not literally quite, but you know, sometimes too. Uh, why wouldn't in a moment of need be couldn't the auxiliary be equipped exactly like a legionnaire? I mean, there's sing s literally not even a single thing of all the so a single evidence of all the sources we have that this wasn't impossible. And, and another thing is that we often exchange, in fact, legionnaires for, for auxiliaries at some point. We don't know in the iconography what wha was who in there. Um, and it's perfectly normal because, again, the legion was uh, basically an army on its own, and it's obviously it was tactically self sufficient, even if they it was, you know, ideally to be complemented by auxiliary troops that were better doing certain performing certain tasks that maybe legionary were or simply they were more expandable, right? But this is enough literally nothing to do with remain un unflexible about how they, they could be equipped and how they, they effectively dealt with these even with the problems that were presented in there because you you know, not all the places where you go fighting are the same. Not all the same enemy, uh, not all the enemies are the same. There's a lot of variation in here, and we have direct proof of this, e explicit proof of this as well. Um, Tacitus, mm, going back to the thing of the helmets and shields, interestingly enough, in fact, speaks of them. Uh, helmets and shields taken in a hurry from a store. The armamentarium, right, and does not mention particular uniforms varied according to the unit. If I'm not wrong, uh, this is the passage during the um, Civilis uh, Revolt when basically both auxiliaries and legionnaires take, uh, you know, in a hurry these this equipment and they don't care um, about who that equipment was. Uh, theoretically destined to and mean that actually legionaries and auxiliaries used the same exact equipment or that it was mixed at least. And helmets and shields especially um, are mentioned here so no other particular uniforms though so it, this means that um, even in talking about clothes etc um, well does not those were not very Important, right, as a sign of distinctions, and that therefore um, such equipment um, didn't vary with the uh, on the base of the unit. And there is further confirmation of this, looking at tombstones of the first century A.D., on which the military dress, the ornatus of the deceased, appears indistinguishable for both the legionnaires and the auxiliaries. Another very important in concept in here, right? There is no concept of modern uniform in here.
Right, there couldn't be. It, did, it didn't serve any purpose at that point. Right, there were other things that made the difference. Um, yet, the elements that allow us to identify the soldiers as legionnaires or auxiliaries are the inscriptions. That's important. And um, also, when present, the unit insignia. Right, so literally the shield devices and the unit standards. These are particularly important. Especially when they're coupled, we can see interesting things, right? Concerning the military clothing instead, the vestis militaris, well, this was certainly worn under different rules and symbols, according to the soldiers' rank and duties, but the loss of most of the color elements, essentials, essential for the identifications and the gravestones and monuments, leaves us with the shield blazons as the main criterion for identifying the Roman units better than nothing, but still controversial. Naturally, all this iconography was renownedly painted at the time. I mean, all the, the sculptures were norm normally painted. Sometimes we were lucky enough to find the, even the traces of the original colors on them, and these have disappeared. But uh, the originals definitely had this uh, th th these colors, and uh, we fr from that we could really understand much more about whether you know some degree of uniformity existed also uh, on from that point of view, um, and that kind of makes more sense because even what we know from the later uniform types is indeed there was a u the the the, the, real the first thing you wanted to uh, identify more easily was color right it was not the type of cloth it was not even the, the form of it it was literally what color is that. Right, because that's simple. You see it. Um, you don't have to recognize every single thing. You, you know, every single cloth and the way it is. Uh, this increased with the complexity of armed forces in modern times. But it, it was average for the ancient world as much as for Middle Ages. That are also not credited with much of uniformity. To actually buy certain amount amount of cloth of a certain color, so already colored, right, and then. This thing would be ra given the way it was, just like a piece of cloth to the soldier that had to provide to actually had it cut right uh, by a tailor so that he could wear that. But the important thing was the collar, and that's why this was this usually passed uh, this um, purchase passed through the military administration because the military administration was the the authority in there that basically decided much more freely than we think what kind of color was needed right and, and we we actually think that rather than the legion what the the most important unit in this regard was effectively the cohort because the cohort has the function essentially of a company roughly speaking or something more often uh, even the maniples because Maniples actually survived even after the Marian reform, right? It's not that things like those um, disappeared. Uh, administratively speaking, it was a pretty explicit uh, difference in this regard. The various Centuria actually were still there, so the, the Maniple at that point was literally the intermediate, th uh, you know, unit grouping that that it didn't cost anything to maintain conceptually, right? Uh, the maniple is more like the the company in there, and we think it's these units that actually made the soldiers kind of more proud of their be belonging to it. And that was where the this predicate for mostly revolve around. There was a hierarchy of these troops, like we think at least that within the same units, uh, this excuse me, same legions. Uh, for example, the first cohort was usually the, the the toughest one. Some say even it was also larger, but we don't have even as it was this in all cases, right? But the important thing is that you would like to color at that point troops, maybe, w in fact, uh, uniformly, so that those could be easily recognizable, especially given that, aside from identitary reasons, um, also, from these were the most tactically active units on the field, so uh, much of uh, the, the outcome of 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 the engagements depended on the interaction between these units um, that were quite dynamic, 
um, in combat and therefore you needed to see who was who and that was quite easy to do if they were all colored in a certain way it could even be spotted in a certain distance so probably this uniformity was even mm, probably greater than we think of course you know it's not that there were cohorts coming back and forth in the field from out of nowhere all the time I mean, people knew commanders knew w w which units this could really be but it's obvious that a, a, an immediate visual impact saying oh well that I see those colors so it's those guys well helped a lot in terms of think about what communications were here at the time actually uh, signaling systems were pretty advanced we made even a video about it um, but uh, still it, it, it's useful and it also actually has psychological advantages not just for the soldiers that belong to to the unit that can feel can identify with that color with that uh, value that stood also behind it um, and that made it easier for them also not to get lost in the in the melee in the dust in the, in the combat etc but also from the other side from the enemy side because it, it's it's terrifying actually to see in front of you an enemy that is so orderly and so organized that cares even about something apparently so unimportant like having a uniform color it, that instead gives this first of all a vision of compactness and cohesion and uniformity that this fee is terrifying believe me. Um, but also that says wow it's against these guys we're fighting against well this is particularly important not even much because of of this sensation of it but thinking about I don't know fighting you know against tribes that surely had their own cohesion and an entity but they didn't have the such great means to organize all at once they had much of a uh, of a you know logistic of a common way of this they were essentially clans put together so these people would, would stick together in the line better as they could um, just taking with their family members and friends right and clients in front of you if you see an entire court and an other course together with that are of one same color it, it, it even makes you think that that group orientatively speaking is more cohesive than, than you are so, um, and it it kind of makes sense because it was effectively so right the Roman legionaries were military professionals m meaning that they spent literally 25 years uh, in the army the auxiliaries even more um, differently from the average tribal warrior that could even be you know maybe very good at knowing terrain and you know used to violence in some form but you know on average uh, quantitatively speaking and statistically speaking was just used to kind of raid um, raiding warfare kind of small uh, intensity warfare Lutwak would call it maybe imp improperly actually um, then the, the the tribal elite that were just a picked body of troops that had the best weapons etc and you know could even uh, be considered superior individually to to the individual roman legionnaire but it was a tiny body right so other things that now exulate from our um from our interest but these are important details in my opinion so the letter um, talking about how these designs were realized, well, the latter surface of the shield was l usually lavishly painted with the digmata of the legion. Right? This is the idea we have. Thus, allowing the identification of the troops on the battlefield. Some shield fragments from Mazada, Palestine, preserve, for instance, traces of paintings. So we know this was done. Right, think about even the shield of Dura Europos that today we, we don't cover, but in that case you have uh, this is a, um, a shield um, that was abandoned essentially, it was found in a, a tucked away in a basement armory. Dura Europos, you know, it's, it's in, in, in the Near East, um, in Syria, if I'm not wrong, proper, and um, because it's at the border, very close to the Arabian Desert actually. Uh, or in it, I don't, I don't remember, uh, but that's the, the the area in general, very peripheral, right? But the part of the reason why stuff got preserved there, especially organic material, this is true also for Egypt because it's very dry weather, it's it's, it's climate, it's good for it. 
um, well, the shield of Duro-Ropos, for example, is painted at the top with an eagle flanked by winged victories and at the bottom by a lion flanked with stars, right, quite elaborate, then this is all over the iconography in part, there are similar, um, you know, and, and, and the area, area in between is filled with successive triangular borders on the side of one another, it forms a Persian carpet-like pattern, um, and um, and it seems that it, it's sort of an antique, specially decorated, maybe kept even for parades, so ne not necessarily the brightest example of the um, of what was used on a regular base, but still of enormous value because it's literally one of the few examples we have of a Roman scotum surviving, and in this case even with shield colors um, and quite of an early date if you want. So it's uh, after all in that that that's quite interesting but we see that this was the standard um, I mean the normality from all the other iconography that that we have um, and the digmata as such were symbols often of religious or mythical significance we've seen here the eagles for example the lion and uh, the eagle has of course uh, the birds sacred to the gods, uh, or the, uh, and especially of Jupiter, that also uh, wielded th these uh, lighting, winged lightning balls, right? So that that's quite the the truest um, Indo-European symbolism at at its best, right? The eagle, and and the thunder, right? So the 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 symbols of, of the celestial deity of war per excellence so scattered all over you know great part of the world um, and that was the the symbol of of, of the empire in itself right of, of the empire as essentially the this faculty that the celestial deity of the sky granted to virtues commanders so that victory was literally a divine gift and this is the imperium was literally what all the uh, all Rome was based on and it were uh, not not that differently from many other powers at that point, but in Rome with this a dramatic ostentation of it, because the Romans uh, truly believed at that point to have reached the the best in some ways of uh, of achievements by conquering literally the entire world, because wherever it is that at the time that's the entire world. Um, and it's been suggested that the presence of an eagle in the digmata undoubtedly signifies a legion right um, this is definitely possible especially in the roman army probably the direction was this one but i personally have some doubt when it comes to you know compare the the, the symbolism to other um, you know units it's, it's obvious that the romans wanted to maintain within their armored forces let's say the prerogative of the eagle Symbolically speaking, but you know th there is also maybe a uh, sort of an emanatistic uh, possibility for which these symbolism eventually got shared in some form. But what is interesting is that even if you look at the notizia di Nitatum, for example, um, th that symbolism has changed. I mean, th there is not this um, eruptive, let's say, uh, eagle bo balls and wings. Um, uh, symbology there. there. There are, for example, way more of animals connected with the afterlife, with the um, other symbologies, also with other deities, other figures. Uh, so there was there was a transformation over time, evidently. And yeah, it's possible that just maybe legionaries had um, such symbols, but and that the auxiliaries were boosted, you know, f in order to um, reach uh, citizenship, so they could share that symbol that belonged to Romanity, which telling the truth was a pretty exclusive idea, right? It's it's obvious that the Romans had this um system of, you know, enlarging their their citizens with but it was still a very exclusive concept behind that. And it had to be proven, especially in the military uniquely true that so it would be interesting to analyze this hypothesis as well, more than it's already surely been done. But the problem is, what we we don't know that much at the end of the day. Um, and often, also the name of the unity and the commander was painted on the shield or engraved on the umbo, 
right um some the umban basically and and some rectangular uh, umbos samples such as those from Carnuntum in today's Austria have the name of the unity written on them for example um Quinturia Avidi Quincti which means of the century of Avidius Quinctus um so here you even see personal names um of of the commanders which which is important because it 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 kind of stresses indirectly the uh, how how units were f were kind of autonomous in their mindset in their even in their identity and how this probably increased the variation of of symbologies within the same army in in, in general um there are also very famous specimens from from Britain found in the Tyne uh, river and dated to the time of Hadrian right at the time of, of the wall um, and um, on which I it's inscribed with the name of the legion and it indicated the name of the unit and of the owner even so this is particularly uh, particularly important also because the umba was I mean conceptually speaking if you think about it it's the one that, that goes first of all because especially in this time the idea of the scutum is used in a uh, somewhat individualistic fashion still we always think the romans ah yeah because romans were in information it's everything information yes but it doesn't still mean that it was like a, a phalanx right in terms of space we actually don't know how space the roman legionaries were the two only two indications vary wildly from from an open order to, to ac actually a phalanx like type but uh, the idea is that the umba is just in front of, of, of you you cover your body on it it's conceived for it uh, I mean, your, sh your shield and, and the umba is just in front of you. So it's literally the first thing in that you even smash against the enemy. The umba was used also aggressively to, to, to break, <laughs> you know, that the, the enemy's mm, face with it. And so that's a pretty way to say, yeah, it's me <laughs> smashing your face with a thing. It's, I have m the name of m myself, of, of my unit, and my commander on. Um, so mm, the decoration of the shield was not only painted, uh, it's important. Um, it was frequent to find metallic applique. Uh, still, interestingly, in the fashion of Jupiter's lightning bolts, the fulgures, right, um, that were very, very common, really, um, as a device, especially among the, the average trooper, uh, and, and um, especially of a particular legion, um, and the um, legionnaires of the 12th legion, Fulminata, in fact, so from the Fulgus, were probably identified, at least at the beginning, by the lightning balls chiseled on their shields. Um, there is another uh, very interesting description given by the poet Valerius Flaccus in his Argonautica, uh, in which he writes that all the phalanx wears embossed on the shields the Jupiter device in the spread fires of the trident shaped lightning balls and you Roman soldier are not the first to wear on the shields the rays uh, and the shining wings of the flashing thunderbolt very interesting for many reasons first of all this is clearly a reference to metallic applique right which is further supported by um, a passage from in Virgil that describes the working of the weapons in Balkan's forge. Um, and it's definitely true that the Romans hadn't been the first people who had made use of, of, of these devices, but also of the same um, solar and also w wings um, uh, symbology. Right. Think about you know this is full of in the in the Hellenistic military culture. At the same time, think about Macedon, the symbol which is is a uh, is a sun, um, or the same Nika, the, the winged victory of the Hellenic mythology. Well, these were all common sim symbolisms you find literally everywhere, um, especially in the, in the Indo-Aryan tradition that were shared and that were there since it's in a long time, and we tend to forget this, like thinking, ah, uh, the Romans, the Romans had, this was like uh, the eagle or, or the thunderbolt were just like a national symbol of the Romans. No, it was a universal symbol of military power. 
shared by lots of peoples, also not in the Europeans. This is something dates back. You find even in Egypt with the oak, with the uh, in Mesopotamia, it's, it's full everywhere of this, right? Um, and as we were saying before, just the Romans kind of well, the Romans stayed <laughs> around for for a longer time in a wider space than many other people, sort of in more recent times, and therefore we we, are, we have plenty of this evidence, but you know takes you to know every single people from the Scythians from in fact of the Greeks but even the Celts the Germans made the same exact symbolism right um, and uh, the Romans were at this point spreading it as uh, you know that they're kind of their own thing but just because they believed that victory and the role of the world had been entrusted to them by the gods right but the concept behind it's much more universalistic as one of the Empire in the first place we also have other symbols, for example a bronze Capricorn it was part of a shield applique decoration and has been found in Emlichheim. Um, these are common, I mean here you see even the zodiac, right? Um, think about the scorpion, uh, that was allegedly, but we, we don't seem to be pretty sure of this, usually the stories that Tiberius, that f f finally, let's say, institutionalized permanently the, the Praetorian guard um, gave uh, them this symbol because he was a Scorpius himself well yeah we, we, we're not really sure about it it's possible in some ways uh, even Augustus had this kind of symbolisms um, of Capricorn uh, at the same time uh, because of all reasons now we can Capricorn was the uh, is, is the, the, the the sign of S Saturnus and then the, there's the Saturnia Tellus that is uh, the other name for Latium where Saturn effectively went so that um, and, and Augustus had been conceived in in, in the, the, the time under the the sign of the Capricorn so all these things that were actually the standard beliefs of those times and um, they if you look at the symbols basically there is nothing literally nothing that is outside of this thing the Romans, by the way, were dramatically superstitious, like most ancient peoples, um, and they truly cared. Like that, the, the symbols had a true magic value. So everything they represented was felt to be, in the typical mm, pagan mindset, we, we call as pagan mindset, seat of a certain force of some kind, right? And it was normal. So naturally. The, all these animals, like either true or imaginary, were they had a particular characteristic, and that the soldiers wanted to 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 take on them and to be patronized by, right? And it was all a a, a religious uh, religion behind. It was actually a, a a proper religion of the of the Roman army as such. I even made a video about it. If you go once again in the Roman uh, warfare playlist it's uh, yeah the Roman the official religion of the Roman army yes that's the title and I discuss a bit of that naturally it was plenty of influences you know at this point Roman society is quite multi-ethnic um, multicultural it has lots of different it, it's a polytheism so literally as many gods you can bring in the better it is um, but still there is this core of shared values that bit found a bit everywhere and uh other are you know more properly roman um in the sense of maybe a the italic background but yeah you can find everything in here um legionary shield applicates probably ha also had um the l shaped edges that are often represented on the shield borders and these were useful not just as a decoration, but actually to reinforce the structure of the shield further, especially around the edges that you can imagine were the, the ones that got more worn out on a regular base. Um, so, yeah, and it still, yeah, it maybe adds that extra weight, but hey, the scutum was like 8 kilos <laughs> in, in weight, and, you know, that's there is an economy behind this of of strengths but uh, there's always a practicality even behind the, the what what seems like a decoration is this is often overlooked i mean truly yes it, not everything that is used in in combat is necessarily ergonomic there can be something idealistic ar about it right there are 
Um, also, never underestimate what, how much the human body can adapt to certain things, to exercise, etc. But in general, I, it seems to me that every single thing we we think was just, you know, uh, aesthetical. Let's put it in this way, or artistical. It w actually had a, m a substantial part, at least, of practical use. And uh, we've seen it, especially in those videos about helmets, that there is always um, an element of practicality behind it. The, the Romans especially were quite oriented towards this, but you know, not that their uh, gear was necessarily more functional than one of other people's. I think that even Hellenic Hoplites, for example, used this metal sheets attached to, to the painted surface, which you know it, it, it would hinder weapon points from being glanced off at the same time, right? So that's particularly important. So talking about Trajan's column, that is one of the most important sources surely for the Roman army, but also specifically for today's topic uh, regarding the connection between the shield um, design, um, painted decorations, let's say, and the, the, the identification of the, the units of reference. Now this is important because mm, much has been written about this and it's been suggested that each of the shields on Trajan's column were commemorating the participation of a specific unit in the campaign or you know an actual an actual unit and uh, it's it's possible right but we can't uh, be sh fully sure about this and we have difficulties sometimes at even understanding as we were saying before vus vu uh in the Trajan column in the first place. Naturally, at the time they knew that it was all, um, uh, you know, the Trajan's column can be read as a story, um, and uh, obviously at the time it was a symbolism that even in Rome was, you know, better definitely understood than than what we can do today. Um, and I will not descend in this topic, but just for saying that. Uh, that there is a huge amount of the devices of the shields represented there that can help the identification at least of some units of the Roman army of the Trajan period. Um, and the unique example of number and title easily recognizable can be that of the cohorts of the legions bearing the name Victrix, so winner, vi victorious. Um, and, and these shields bear <coughs> painted or embossed a uh, corona hour, the, the golden crown while other legionary cohorts have the shields adorned with the corona civica, so the uh, civic crown. These were certain decorations, we will make a video about it one day um, to explain what they, they are. There were several actually, but they were given after, you know, usually a proof of bravery of having stormed a certain place, having saved someone's life, depending on which one. And the reconstruction of the colors of so, uh, some Roman shields from the Middle Imperial era can only be conjectured. This is the real point. Like w that's all we know. We don't have the notizia di Nitatum, as we've seen before, um, but we can trace maybe a certain continuity from early Imperial times, actually in, in low Imperial times even at the times of the 4th, 5th uh, century document of the Notizia di Nitatum. Because some people actually believe that um, the, uh, the digmat of some old Roman legions actually survived, on, just as actually th the old Roman legions survived in, uh, in later centuries. Sometimes they were split, other times remained. Right, but there is a, a substantial continuity, in fact, with the ancient Roman legions, even in you know certain of the, um, I think even late Republican legions are to be found still in the sixth century, if I'm not wrong. I mean, but very few, like just one, if I'm not wrong. But just for telling you how in here there was also um, uh, not just an administrative continuity, but I mean the idea that, that the unit in itself, together with its insignia, in fact, was sacred. This is an aspect that should be stressed, right? That every legion kind of had its own uh, esprit de corps reinforced by this um, kind of 
per I mean legionary in fact r religion and cults and and symbolism and 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 ways and uses right and this is very important it was a story of the legion it was a there was a um, past that had to be preserved it was a the insignia were sacred so you you couldn't lose them you couldn't disband use this unit because there was an inherent quality in it and that's why for example when certain units were wiped out in case of a major defeat like to to Tiderburg first they, they were usually not reconstituted in fact unless the the insignia were recovered so that there could be a continuity in there but you know there were many reasons for this um you know it was a sort of spell a pos i mean a, a, s a sacred a positive one um that could not be broken in many ways it was a true commitment i mean the soldiers were had to be ready to die for for the legion point like the, the we don't have to think that this was um uh kind of a soft happy war like just you it was a job like another one like you just apply sign, sign there yeah it's 25 years but uh, you know um there was an enormous commitment aside from the fact that people lived less at the time so 25 years of service means that you spend great part of your life in this unit. It really becomes a part of yourself. Also, many people that were discharged, many legionaries, kept basically gravitating around the legion in one way or another, often because they lived close to the the, the encampments, the the fortifications. So, um, we we do know that there was um, that these legions represented also a world around which certain communities gravitated. The legions participated. They even carried out um you know works certain engineering where they built bridges roads th this is what the army did right they even staged uh, spectacles um usually in fact was the the city and uh, the, the legionary fort and, and then an amphitheater and, and the soldiers all had all special privileges right they had their own baths they had like it was a you know it was a, a contract objectively and and it was a contract that you couldn't break so easily right so discipline was a, a real serious matter as you know um, and uh, so it's been rightfully believed that even some ground colors the ones we can uh, f see in the notizia di dignitatum actually were the same original colors of the previous uh, from the legions these units had come from in later Roman times right um, and it, it, it can Mm, yeah, it's perfectly plausible in my opinion. We just don't know which color corresponded to which uh, cohort, actually, of, of the one that Vegetius says. Because Vegetius, well, I forgot to say, Vegetius is talking specifically, if I'm not wrong, exactly about the cohorts when he said that they all had one color to, to recognize. Anyway, uh, it is probable that the Imperial Battle Shield was therefore painted with an identifiable color probably a dark red or violet purple ground combined with gilded or gold applique. Right? Valerius Flaccus always in his Argonautica uh, however refers to the shield of Ju Jupiter as nigrans, so black. A probable reference to a true scutum or also a, a clipeum painted I in such a way. You know there was a difference between the scutum and the clipeum basically the first one was the the, the, the oblong shaped one, and um, the, the most iconic of the Roman legion. The the, the clipium was this stand normally the round one, still used also, kind of a more classical, classicist um, uh, fashion, and also usually better refined, kind of a, a representative arm uh, arm rather than uh, than particularly employed, usually adopted by officers, right? But we'll ta talk about that on another occasion. So talking about the shield cover, this was usually made of ox leather uh, or occasionally even of goat skin, right? And there are beautiful fragments of these uh, tegimenta that have been found, um, for example, at the military camp of Vintovissa. And such fragments correspond to the um, typology even showed on the on the monuments. For example, rectangular, like in Trajan's column oval instead of the column of Marcus Aurelius uh, and round as well and um, this was the ordinance cover let's say of the Roman shield uh, as we have seen it was mandatory basically and 
The shape corresponds perfectly to the descriptions of the sources and to the figurative monuments alike. So we, we're pretty sure it really worked uh, like this. Um, and the fragments usually show the mark of a band of constant size that is slightly impressed on the surface, right? Um, and also many traces of the um, tabula ansata, which was basically this tablet on which the name of the legion um, was written, right? So the the tabula ansata was sometimes also painted on the shield surface. So that that that's, that was an important identity for sometimes also the name of the it was usually a number, right? Um, and and a um, you know abbreviation of, of the name of the legion. And sometimes the letter of the tagimenta was decorated with applique representing the uh, the genius of the legion, the genius proper. So here the protective divinity, as we've seen that every every unit had right. The, the Romans had a, a a genius for for literally every thing, um, and it was kind of obsessive at some point. But still, like there was a hierarchy in it. Naturally, the one of the, the legion was the, the most important and had a, a higher power. Um, and um, there is, for example, there is a fragment from Bonnerberg which is decorated with the image of Minerva, the tutelary goddess, in fact, of the first legion, Minerva. Hmm? And it is probable that such image was also painted or attached on the actual shield right so that wasn't rare like if you look at medieval shields you find saints depicted on it why wouldn't a roman legionnaire have the beautiful picture of minerva on it it also is by the way the goddess of war and of, of wisdom right and um, that is quite meaningful it's the the interesting to to a symbol that the uh, was um, quite meaningful in the idea of citizenry soldiery, um, but in in this regard, it was in fact not much of a choice on the of the legion. It was the name of of, of the legion in proper. But we have to think that such names, even such tutelar gods, really brought together maybe even a certain character, certain psychological profile of, of the legion in itself. Uh, under certain point of view, I mean, highlighting certain aspect or uh, certain aspects of the, the, with this um, divinity's, um, you know, power that that was really more felt by the legionaries compared to one of the other legion. And this rich repertory of Vindavissa, especially, can can be explained by looking at the camp as a production of center for shields which is attested by this small wooden tablet that bears the name of the Scutarius, so literally the shield maker Valerius, right? So they made shields there. As we've seen, this, this was normal, actually. They, they, the, the, the same legionnaires were in charge sometimes of building their own equipment, not just receiving it from the military. I mean, they were part of the military administration themselves in that regard, and they relied on this local production as much as the, the the more centralized one that existed in parallel. And such fragments also help us to recognize the shi uh, the shape of a shield in itself, right? So, um, for example, there's the fragment of a rectangular shield cover in dark ox hide, which measures 75 centimeters. So. Um, uh, Gans Burkhardt uh, came up with the idea that we're talking about a shield of 120 125 centimeters. On the edge of the shield cover, the wooden frame had left a mark of about 3.5 centimeters, where the rounded corners follow the shape of the shield. Right, so. Um, Th this is interesting because th this was designed exactly following the, the 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 form of the shield in itself. This is normal; otherwise, it would have been too much attrition. That even was here anyway, as we have seen. And there is around the edge still the 
trace of a stitched seam of 2-3 centimeters, which implies basically the wooden frame of the shield was not nailed. But probably soon, right, uh, to the latter cover, which in turn form a solid structure for the shield, it was better than the nailed edge, and uh, the, there is, we, we don't know how this shield was practically, but probably certain tombstones at Basel that probably very similar, portrayed his shields as very similar to this one. And unfortunately, we can't discern the decorative motive anymore. But we have the general impression that it could have been very similar to some of those visible on uh, the Trajan column, some scenes of the Trajan column. And um, yeah, we're talking about sizes, maybe it's not our ideal here, but um, it's still important to, to fix it on, on, on the cover and the taggy men. Um, talking about cavalry now, because cavalry shields are also evident. Um, there's a, a one from Falcon Book, for example, that is oval in shape. This is kind of stereotypical, also the idea that uh, you know the legionnaires on foot used the, the rectangular shield and not the oval one. Or maybe they just the auxiliaries did. There's no proof of this. There were different forms of many types. If you want, they were even hexagonal, even circular shields, as we've seen. And there is no proof that, aside from certain iconographic representations, like that there was an actual standardization in the form of the shield. And um, and actually, that also depends, as we've seen, on who you think it's a legionary or not on uh, iconography. For example, in Trajan's column, it's not that clear in some cases. Um, so this shield cover in Falkenberg is made of two separate but identical pieces of leather that are joined in the middle by laces and the you can't see that the covers helped to protect the shield against damp just like with the infantry uh, ones um, and they were usually made of uh, goat skin and had as well the tabulae and satae applied it to them uh, which indicated the owner and the unit. Mm -hmm. And the surface of cavalry shields was lavishly painted to or decorated with embossed appliques just like the other shields. Uh, it was very standard and one of the concepts is that actually you can use these sh shields um, easily like both on foot and on horseback so there is not much of a difference after all in the same uh, the same legionaries could ride a horse on um, on average, we think, and surely uh, the knights could dismount dismount pretty 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 easily as well. Um, so we have on Trajan column this idea that the auxiliaries somewhat invariably carried the oval flat shield, as instead uh, the legionaries carry in opposite the rectangular shields. And we think that tendentially it is an actual thing, I mean at least in the intention of the uh, of the artist. And it seems to be confirmed in fact even by other um, sites like the uh, Adam Cleese monument. However, as we were saying now, some units, actually many units on the same column, are that are considered on usually as auxiliaries might be as well common legionnaires right um, there are um, for example and we can get this from 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 the symbolism that they have on the on on the shields for example uh, there's a soldier in the scene uh, 48 uh, near a carved tree that has a noble shield, right? That is conceived to be typical of the cavalry f uh, form, right? But it has as a device the she wolf with a gemini, an eagle on lightning bolts and staff, which is clearly a legionary digmat, right? Um, and, and therefore, this can be an, can't be an auxiliary. Also, behind this guy, there is a warrior armed with a light pilum 
right? Which is the only image of such a javelin in the wall column. So just for saying how what we consider as stereotypically legionary, for example, that column is not port portrayed. Um, that is interesting. We should talk about the pillar and what was was its actual employment because people think it's, it was just a standard thing that every legionary used in the same way, stereotypically in a certain fashion. But even on that, we, we should really see what what it worked like for real on the base of actual evidence, which is a different thing from wishful thing. But um, this is um, in this specific example in the scene 48 of the Trajan column could be easily not a representation of an auxiliary, but of common legionnaires. Albeit they are kind of dressed like auxiliaries, according to the to the to, to the stereotype that we have traced about this. So on the Marcus Aurelius column, all the legionnaires are carrying oval and round shields. Other very important thing. Um, so very different from Trajan's column, from which we mostly base this idea that you know in second um, century A.D. most Roman troopers would have the quadrangular shield. No, actually not. And as far as we realize today, historiographically speaking, the rectangular shield as well as the segmented um, armor was never prevalent at any time in the Roman arm. It was always kind of a minority thing. But, you know, the question is why representing them in that way, etc. We don't know most of the times. And we have a grave on, of an auxiliary soldier from the age of Marcus Aurelius near, near Serdica. Uh, um, the Nubian area that has revealed a very similar oval shield with part of the wooden structure still in place. The shield in this case was covered by white leather and the umbo uh, in iron is intact. It was fixed to the middle of the shield as usual and corresponded with this wooden transverse bar that was attached to the shield by means of four metal fasteners and each fixed by two rivets on the outer surface. And the umbo is 20 s centimeters in diameter. It's fixed to the wood by five rivets, right? And um, if you look at it in section, it's slightly pointed, which is something that would occur also in, in the future with the umbonus to be sometimes even more offensive, right, as a weapon. Um, the shield we have just described is, rec is reconstructable to fragments, like by outlining the, the, the all the traces. Um, in, in and it was something like 84 centimeters long and 120 centimeters wide. Same grave. There are two spears, um, each one two meters long, with this uh, leaf-shaped points of. 50 centimeters long and uh, about 10 centimeters in a sword 76 centimeters long and a metallic scabbard of copper alloy still intact which is pretty rare um, this was such an exceptional find and uh, it represents a, a trash and uh, auxiliary of the second century which actually corresponds pretty well to the iconography the pictorial sources especially so you you understand how tricky that can get, right? And there are definitely many other things we could say, looking at all the examples of various symbols you 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 can find, because we're actually pretty rich in evidence. The only problem we don't know exactly what corresponded to what specifically. Um, all right, so I think we could stop here right and maybe address the problem of really looking at the, the various single shields on, on another occasion like the, the shield designs proper right to, to understand what kind of colors these guys could be we have some evidence for example even from gladiator gladiatorial um, fights like uh, always f from iconography which kind of designs were also pretty well 
represented, but that's yet another thing. Um, and uh, chiefly, we lack the colors. That that's the main problem. Like the the designs are pretty clear sometimes, but um, there is no necessarily. And uh, many of these symbols, however, are still susceptible to some sort of um, interpretation. Like we have so many different stars, moons, uh, wings. Um, we've seen it before. Um, the daisies, flowers, um, things like this, they all had a meaning of some sort. Um, we just don't realize all, most of the times what, 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 whether this were standard of a particular unit, which unit, and how these things could, could change over time. Right? If there was a margin for free of, you know, of representation of still the thing could we're we're more rigid in this regard. However, I think we can't stop here for today. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.